welcome to the Third Paddle Podcast. I'm your host, Jen McFarland. Have you ever felt like somebody might just be really cool? Well, when I read Gerald Jones's podcast guest profile, I gotta tell you, he looked pretty cool to me. And then we talked and it was like, <laughs> mind blown. And I think you're gonna think the same thing after you hear this interview. So please stay tuned. Welcome to the Third Paddle Podcast, recorded at the Vandal Lounge in beautiful Southeast Portland, Oregon. Why the Third Paddle? Because even the most badass entrepreneurs get stuck up in business shit creek. Management consultant Jennifer McFarland is your Third Paddle, helping you get unstuck. Did you know that social media was literally designed to be like a slot machine? Having us come back and back and back and see how many people like this, how many people are doing that. And if you run a business or are in the business of running a family, you don't have time for that. So if you're feeling a little chained to your phone or like maybe you're not getting as much out of email and social media as you're putting into it, go to jenmcfarland.com slash ebooks and download the Digital Tradeoffs ebook today. Start looking at your time and seeing if you can be more effective toward reaching your goals. Thanks a lot. Gerald Jones is an experienced leader, coach, speaker, and training facilitator with over 18 years of experience building and mentoring higher performance teams. He has been producing business-focused audio content since 2017. In addition to his podcast, By Black Podcast, The Voice of Black Business, he has been a guest on a variety of other shows. Gerald is a captivating public speaker with a unique ability to explain complex ideas clearly and concisely. He also interviews seasoned business owners in a manner that helps him share their knowledge and experience with a general audience. In February 2018, Gerald was requested to deliver the keynote presentation at the Establishing Sustainable Connections Building Black Wealth Seminar in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. In June, he was asked to return as a guest instructor for the Conscious Youth Solutions Youth League Apprenticeship Program. That's a mouthful, but I will tell you what, Gerald Jones is amazing, and I am so pleased to have him on the show. We're talking about a variety of amazing topics, so let's listen to what he has to say. So um, let's talk about you. Um, Can you tell the listeners about your journey with Buy Black? podcast? I can. So that podcast started um, about a year before it started. Uh, and, and everybody knows about this now, right? In, in July of 2016, um, July 5th, in fact, um, Alton Sterling was killed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We all saw the videotape and then it was even plastered on the front page of newspapers um, the next day. And that next day, uh, Philando Castile was killed in uh, Minneapolis. And for some reason, and I I know the reasons, at that time, I was really undergoing a transformation of heart. Um, I just finished my bachelor's degree. um, And I was kind of going through a period of trying to, I guess, finally find who I am. But those things happened at a time where I was really, they, they shook me uh, and things like that had happened before, but those two really shook me and I was free because I'd finished my degree and I was looking for my next project. And so those told me, whatever I do, it has to be in service to the black community. And I want to change the outlook. I want to change the future. I want things like this to not happen. And Then I started trying to process through my head, how do I see these things not happening? And so I just spent the next several months trying to figure out how can I use my skills and background to help. And eventually I started listening to podcasts. I found one called the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. As I was listening to that show, I listened to an episode that played a speech of uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, who has this concept called the, the five levels of control that first level being control of economics. And then I was like, okay, so if we can figure out a way to take control of the economy, then we can have more people um, with jobs. We can build more wealth. We can start investing in our communities. Fewer people are going to be out on the streets, which means fewer people are going to be seen as threats, which means the police, uh, 
relationship with the black community will eventually change if we only just start being able to depend on, on ourselves um, economically. So that was when I started connecting with people who are all about this buy black movement. And the idea came to me for the podcast. And I immediately said, somebody's already doing that. It's, that's too big a thing that people are talking about for there not to be a buy black podcast. So I went searching, searching, searching. There's no buy black podcast. And I was like, okay, so maybe a thing. And then I went to a blog and I found 20 black business owners and their emails for different articles of, you know, new businesses that were out. And I literally sent 20 cold emails to people I'd never heard of before that basically said, Hey, I'm Gerald. You don't know me. I've got an idea. Would you want to be a part of it? And 20 cold emails to business owners. I got 10 responses. And of those 10 responses, I got five that said, yes, absolutely. So I'm like, I don't know much about marketing, but that's definitely a really high conversion rate. I must be on to something. And so I just went full bore and set everything up for the podcast and, you know, uh, got the Libsyn hosting and got the, um, the cover art made and came up with a structure and everything and then did my first interviews. And um, I did the interviews a little bit in advance, but I debuted the first episode on July 5th, 2017, uh, specifically because, you know, this show was, it was hatched by uh, that event and I wanted to make sure that I launched the show on the anniversary uh, of that event. Amazing. I mean, it's amazing. Like it's so sad that it takes the repeated problems in the community to cause action, but it's so amazing that you're taking action and making change. And um, so one of the things that we've talked about is kind of how the podcast has changed then subsequent to the launch. Um, Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yes. So I I launched the podcast and originally the show name was Buy Black, Build the New Black Wall Street. Um, That was, again, um, a concept that threw back to the old days where uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the early 1900s, there was a community called Greenwood. And um, that was a segregated black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that because of segregation, all the black people there had to buy from black owned businesses. And so in that community, there were um, there were lawyers, there were doctors, there were bus lines, there were hospitals, there were schools. Um, There was so much money flowing through the Greenwood community over and over and over again, that there was massive wealth that was built within this small black community because the money came in and then the money just kept turning over and it kept growing and it became one of the richest communities in the United States. Well, in June, uh, actually I think it was June 19th, 20th and 21st of, um, of 1921, there was, um, they call it a riot, but it wasn't a riot. It was a massacre where um, one of the things that happens in history is, you know, a a woman accused a black man of something. And because of that accusation, the community just said, well, let's just go in and kill everybody. And they burned down the entire community. Um, And so uh, they burned down what was called black wall street at the time. And then the state of Oklahoma prevented outside entities from coming in and investing to rebuild it. So the community was, uh, was burned to the ground. Over 300 people were killed. And then the state of Oklahoma prevented it from being able to build back up. So this idea, this terminology of we need to build the new black wall street um, has, is the thing that again, is part of kind of the, the culture of folks who are trying to empower the black community. And that was how I originally started the show. As I was building the show over the course of the year, I started noticing that um, the listenership and the folks who engaged with the show, a lot more were those entrepreneurs and those business owners who either wanted to learn how to better start their business or grow their business, or who wanted to get to the platform to get a voice for their business. And so I, I did have a lot of listeners who wanted to support Black-owned businesses, but far and wide, the folks who reached out 
and the folks who were engaging with the show and sharing the show, they were business owners who were just happy to hear the voices of other black business owners like them and who were reaching out to get on the show so they could get their voice heard because it's so hard for a small business without a whole lot of resources to get earned media. And so for free, I was creating a platform that was really growing, that was getting them access to an audience that didn't cost them anything. And so it turned out that the show was really more of a voice for black business. And so I changed the name of the show from Buy Black, Build a New Black Wall Street to Buy Black, The Voice of Black Business. And so I've been doing that. And here recently, I've put the show on hiatus. I ended what we call season one. I'll be bringing it back this summer on July 5th of 2019. And we're just going to cut the buy black off the front of it. And the show is going to come back just as the voice of black business, because that's really what it has grown into is um, there are other business podcasts. There's other black entrepreneurship and business podcasts out there, but I'm really focused on trying to make sure that that black business owner who doesn't have a name, who doesn't have a huge brand, who doesn't have folks beating down their door saying, come over here and be my expert. I want their story to get told because I, I have talked to so many great business owners over the year who never would have been heard and their stories and their experience and their knowledge is second to none. Those stories need to get told and that knowledge needs to get out to the community. And a podcast is a great way to capture that for literally decades. I mean, this, the content's going to be here. The internet's not going anywhere. So um, I love the direction the show has grown and I'm just looking forward to the next iteration of it. That just sounds so amazing. I mean, there are, you're right. There are so many people that really, I, I mean, for all of us, right? It's hard to get any sort of coverage, period, you know, let alone free coverage. And so to be a platform for people to tell their stories and engage and, and stand in their power and expertise is really huge. Um, so I appreciate everything about what you said and what you're doing. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Black Wall Street. Somebody, there's a documentary about it. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that one, but I know that there's been a few. It's hard to find information. You know, I found that there are yeah. a lot of folks in the Black American community who've never heard of Greenwood. I I'd never heard of it. And somebody sent me on Twitter um, because I sent out a message and said, I'm doing a new segment called Equity Corner. What should I talk about? And a, a woman sent me um, uh, information about it and she's, and I was like, what's that? And she sent me the links to like several, I think several different, um, you know, maybe excerpts from the different documentaries or I haven't watched it yet. I've, I haven't, it was on Monday, um, but I had never heard of it. And then you're describing it more. And it, it seems to me that that's what's happened again and again in the African-American community because it's happened here in Portland. If you look up um, Vanport, um, it's a large flood that basically displaced, um, you know, the, our African-American community here. And I know that when we talked um, before we, before today, we kind of, we talked about how important it is um, to build community around African-American entrepreneurship um, why do you think that that's so critical? It's, it's critical because, you know, the, the natural tendency of, of people, of humans, is to gravitate to like people, right? Um, and, and that's not just skin color. I mean, that's even uh, among different ethnic groups who have the same skin color. We have cultural things in common. We have history in common. We've been educated in a way where we just get each other. Our vernacular is the same. Like all of these things are there. And in every other culture in society, and I mean, even within the United States, there's a link back to something that draws people together. Um, if, you, if you look at every immigrant population in the United States, within two generations of that immigrant population coming to the United States, they have completely assimilated. They have completely become a part of the economy, even while those populations still have economic sectors and businesses that are tied to their culture. 
and other people in the United States go to specific places where those people live in order to consume the authentic culture. And company or businesses within those communities are uh, built and up by the people in the community. People support each other in their businesses in those communities. And it happens like that with every immigrant population. And that includes immigrant populations who come from Africa. Mm -hmm. But the Black American community, we don't have that link. And the links that we have tried to reestablish over decades, for a long time, they kept getting ripped apart. Like you were just saying, um, Black Wall Street, Vanport, those were just two of literally dozens of examples of the exact same thing. Um, in fact, in the early 1900s, and I don't mean to go on a history lesson here, but when the great, great migra migration was going on where black people were leaving the South in droves because all this manufacturing was happening in the North and all of these jobs were available in the North, you mean I can do anything other than being a sharecropper who ends up further in debt at the end of the year? with my family never being able to move up. Oh, we're packing up. We're leaving overnight. We're going. And so now you have all of these new black families going into these places and they're competing for work with poor whites. Mm -hmm. And now that's when labor unions start being developed. Partially it's developed because the management is not being fair, but a lot of them were developed because we need to keep the black people out. We need to make it where we, can still get paid without them driving down our wages. And where that didn't work, that's when the violence came in. That's when, oh, this guy over here whistled at me. Okay, we'll kill all of them. And it happened over and over again and again. And the outcome, the long-term outcome of that is that every time that we started building community and wealth and this bridge to the next generation, someone would come in and literally burn it all down. And then once we got to the 1960s and the civil rights act was passed and the voting rights act passed and the new, uh, not the new deal, the great society, uh, war and poverty laws passed through integration. We lost whatever entrepreneurship and business ownership was left because now it became a symbol of uh, status to say, I don't have to shop in this black owned business I can shop where white people shop. So now, <clears throat> even within the black community, there was no sense of, I need to take care of my neighborhood first. We need to take care of each other first. For so long, this group of people had been shut out that it became a psychological and an emotional need to be seen as part of. And that meant, if I can buy from you, that means that I'm part of you. Not realizing that, they were literally killing all the businesses that were supporting their community. And so that's where we've been for the last 50 years. And we have to educate people of just how important it is that the black community has that sense of support economically, both within the community and from outside the community as every other group in the United States has, um, because you will go, say you live in the Bay Area, you will go to Chinatown so that you can consume authentic Chinese goods. People don't go into the black community to consume authentic black American goods. They go to other companies who assimilate our culture and then sell it back to us and they give them the money because they want to look like it, but they don't want to actually go to where we are and consume it from us. And so mm -hmm. it's an internal need to reestablish the importance of community and then it's an external need to set the precedent of this is how you interact with every other group and their good services and authentic culture we need to normalize that this is how the black american community is interacted with as well both internally and by everybody else absolutely i i couldn't agree more i think that so that i think that we need to build community and um, and support one another. And I think it's important to acknowledge that in the African-American community, there isn't that same, um, I don't, just to support, you know, dedication to like, this is my community. I'm going to, I'm going to buy from other people, um, because then it gets better for everyone. Um, right. 
and I think you're right. I think it has to do with this idea of status and, um, I, you know, how can we encourage people to see that like there's, it's equally stat, there's a lot of status around owning a business and, you know, right. so buying from each other is, um, helpful, and, you know, and there's a lot of, uh, and that, that understanding of status of being a, a business owner is there. There's a lot of people who want to start a business. Um, but on the flip side of it, um, you know, if you, if you go on the social media and you tell people, Hey, I got a new job. Mm -hmm. loves, likes, hearts. I mean, you'll get 50,000 comments. Hey, I just opened a business, nothing or criticism. Um, it's just, it's, it's a long road. Mm -hmm. And, And, you know, one of the things that has really helped me and one of the things that I think that really helps African American people, especially in business or actually just anywhere is when you have a lot of friends who are African immigrants Mm -hmm. and you can sit and listen to them as a black person and how they see us. If they'll tell you the truth, most of them pity the black American because we don't see that we are still connected, that we still have a link. They, Mm -hmm. they know that they have that link back to Africa and they Mm -hmm. know that if we could open our eyes and see that connection that we could have that link too. But our mind frame has been so warped through slavery and then not official slavery. And then 400 years of oppression, (laughs) right? You know, 400 years of oppression will do that to you, right? Generations of it. And so now we don't see the connection we, and it's a, it's a world of, I wish they could see what's right in front of them but we have to rebuild it. Um, it's just, it's been gone for generations. Yeah. Well, something that, that we talked about um, leading up to the interview was, you know, the whole idea that we're a nation of immigrants, um, but we're not. And we need to start acknowledging that, um, that some people were brought here against their will and ripped from their communities and other people were already here. So they're the, the African-American community who were brought here as slaves against their will, and then the Native American community who was already here. And when we start to put everybody in this generalization, I think it does a lot of harm. And um, it just continues the cycles of oppression by not acknowledging, um, especially for me as a white person, that it, it's like, like not acknowledging um, different experiences. Yes. you know, and, and how that affects, um, generations like you were mentioning. Um, right. and, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's, that's really interesting. I'd never heard, I've never heard anybody say that Africans pity African Americans like for the, yeah. Wow. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. And, you know, it's interesting. So I, I know I tell a lot of stories. I was I was speaking at um, at a Black Economy uh, event up in Sioux Falls, Cal- South Dakota last year, and then I got to hang out with some of the folks who were up there. And there's a large uh, immigrant population up there uh, from all different countries across Africa. So I was hanging out with some folks who had come from uh, Nigeria, and we were having a conversation. I was having a conversation with one of them, and um, we were having a conversation about ownership. And I started talking about the fact that a lot of the manufacturing that happens in the United States now, even when it's in the United States, a lot of those companies have already been purchased by Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. And they own a lot of our manufacturing businesses here in the United States and basically exporting all of our, our wealth. And one of the other guys who came over, as he was hearing me talk about this, he was like, wait a minute, you know about that? And I was like, well, yeah, I know about this. He was like, I haven't talked to any black American who knows about that. Like, it's just common knowledge among a, a lot of kind of educated and smarter African immigrants because they've seen that happen a lot across the continent with China there mm-hmm. as well. But it's the, the things happening behind the scenes. We are really cut out of a lot of that here in the U.S. And so they come here and then they see it's like we don't our eyes aren't open to a lot of what's going on around us because we're just not part of the economy like that. We don't, 
generally see all of these things going on behind the scenes. And without that context, it's hard to be to own your economy. It's hard to be a successful business owner or network uh, when you don't have the context of what happens away from just the customer facing side of business. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I started really educating myself a little more around, um, so, so it started for me on several fronts, but my most recent, um, I guess, research around um, uh, African-American women in particular started because I had a really crappy experience as a woman in tech. And then I started thinking, well, how many women are there in tech? And it's like 22%. Hmm. Um, But then as soon as you start looking at like, you know, women of color, it's like, we're down to like 2%. Yeah. So it's a very isolating experience. Um, And then you go into uh, venture capitalists. 8% 8% of all venture capital goes to women-owned businesses. The statistic I saw earlier this week was that 0. 0.000, so three zeros, 0. 0.0006% goes to black women. Mm. Um, and I have yet to figure out, like, so how many businesses get venture capital and then do the math. But basically, um, black women are cut out of a lot of business entrepreneurship. There aren't a lot of women founders, um, but then not a lot of um, black women in particular um, that are getting access to the money. And when you start to look across the board, you begin to see, I think, real patterns of obstacles um, that I as a white person don't get. I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have those same obstacles in front of me. Um, so what do you see as some of the obstacles to success um, for black entrepreneurs? Um, and you can speak in general or even what you've seen based on um, gender. So what, what I have done a lot over the last year uh, or two is I've tried to look at a lot of comparisons between um, racism and sexism because um, th- Obviously, everything is intersectional. Um, being being a woman puts you at a disadvantage. Being of a particular race may put you at a disadvantage. Being a woman of a particular race puts you at a combined disadvantage. It's like you know, um, um, it's when you take it's a multiplier alcohol. effect. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. alcohol and uh, and a downer and one plus one equals four, right? Like I remember that in chemistry <laughs> class. Right. Uh, you'll, this is why you overdose so easily if you do this, because you add one to the other. It's not two, it's four. And that's how intersectionality works. So um, when when I look at things and, and a lot of times when I have conversations with, um, especially with white women, um, I use a lot of these comparisons and I've never been a woman. I can't speak to what it is to be a woman. But in a lot of cases, I just kind of wing it and I substitute uh, misogyny for racism and I substitute woman for black. But I use the exact same words of a thing that happened to me. Mm-hmm. And the head starting out is like, that happens to me all the time. And I'm like, and what do you think? Freaking sexism. I'm like, exactly. That's also how racism works. Power treats yeah the disadvantaged in very similar ways. We just call it different things. And so I think one of the biggest things is just recognizing that, you know, when you have a system that was originally built such that only land owning white males had a say in anything, it's really hard to, first of all, you have to recognize that every other law and practice and cultural norm underneath that original document is also built towards that. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to take that in over centuries to pull that stuff out. But it also becomes so normal that the people who are within that group, which today would be, you know, kind of your, your white Christian male, that the people in that group, it's impossible for them to see that there's a disadvantage even to the white Christian woman, right? Uh, Because they just think it's normal the way that we do this thing. And then as you go further uh, down the line, the the disadvantages stack and and really the disadvantages just come back to these these cognitive biases that people have. Um, 
I would say by and large today, most of the people in society that you talk to, if you just ask them survey questions and said, should things be like this and should things be like that? Most of them would say it should all be equal and they would genuinely mean it. There's Mm -hmm. only really a few buttholes out there, but most (laughs) of those people also don't realize that things aren't that way. They they don't realize when they're saying or doing something that is shutting a woman out. They don't realize that the few, the 22% of women in tech are probably more competent than 90% of the men in tech because to be a woman getting into tech, you have to give them no reason that they could possibly discount you. You have to be better because then it's like, oh, well, I see why she's here because right. she's almost as good as me. No, she's better than you. Yeah. Way better. Because otherwise she wouldn't have gotten through the door. And like we said, with the one plus one equals four, when you are a when you are a woman, when you are a woman of color, when you are a LGBTQ woman or man of color, if we're talking about uh, you know trans, then it just stacks and stacks and stacks. And in order to get yourself through that door, you have to walk in more qualified than the person who's probably leading the entire thing just to get entry level. And the folks who are in charge, they look at that and say, oh, well, that person actually met our minimum qualifications, not realizing that literally the standard that they required of this person is nowhere near the standard that they required of the guy who they just literally looked and said, he's got a nice face and he finished college. Here's a job. (laughs) So true. Oh my God. Yeah. No. And, and, and it extends often, not always to even if a woman is willing to apply, um, they, they say that women are more likely to be like, okay, I qualify for every single bullet point. Um, and I think that, and men are just like, okay, I want to do this. And, (laughs) um, and I would say that if you are a white dude, you know, that you can, skate in on some stuff. Um, and then if you're not, <laughs> then, yeah. then you, you know you have to check the, every single box. Yes, so, absolutely. Um, and I think that's another case where you can, um, where the misogyny and the racism um, yep. can be flipped. I think that that's a, um, would you agree with that? That that's another uh, I agreed a hundred percent. And then yeah. the, the next piece of getting in there, once you're in every, you have to be perfect. Um, any one mistake is a reason why, see, we were right. She didn't belong. Right. Right. Or he um, didn't belong. Or, or he didn't belong. It's, yeah. it, it's, you have to be perfect. There are no second chances. And so where you have the guy who's literally just like, it's no big deal. I made a mistake. It's whatever. We all do it. Um, it's, it really is from everybody's perspective. It's not a big deal for the woman, for the person of color. It's like, this is the end of, this is the end of the world. Um, you know, I, and it extends to our children. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry. Another quick story. Sorry. And I'm not, I can't, don't apologize. I I love stories. (laughs) I love it. um, I I don't, I, I can't say for sure. This is, exactly what this is, but it's just one of those things. It's another thing about racism and sexism is that a lot of times you suspect it's there, but you can't prove it. And so you don't want to say anything about it because you can't. But I had something happen a few weeks ago. Um, My youngest daughter, six years old in the first grade, she came home and she said that she got kneed in the stomach by a little boy at recess. And so she was fine. We talked to her. We asked her what happened. We asked her what happened with the teacher, blah, blah, blah. And she said she had never had a problem with this kid before. He wasn't a kid who picked on her. He wasn't a kid who picked on people. But apparently he was mad about something. She was the closest person. He just decided to knee her in the stomach. So send an email to the teacher to ask about this event. She sends an email back saying, oh, yeah, this happened. I talked to her after. I talked to him after. I made him apologize. And then I gave him consequences afterwards. And I'm like, okay, if anything like this ever happens again, we need to hear it from you before school is out rather than my six-year-old coming home and saying, hey, violence was done to me today and me having heard nothing about it from an adult. So we just had our parent-teacher conferences this week, 
And I brought that back up. And, and I said, I don't need to know how this child was disciplined, but I do need to know, were his parents told what he did? No, because he's a good kid and we've never seen anything like this before. And he's just such a sweetheart and we took care of it. And so, and I'm like, wasn't a big deal that this kid need my kid in the stomach because he'd never done anything like that before. So now there's no paperwork. His parents don't know what he did. And if this pattern of behavior continues, no one is there to correct it. No one is there to say, what's going on in your life that you think this is how you deal with anger? And because he's a good kid, we don't say anything to his parents. Again, I can't say sexism. I can't say racism. I can't go in and say, if that had been one of my kids, you would have been trying to kick him out of the school because I don't know. I don't know if that's just how they deal with all kids who are violent in that school, but based on the policies I've seen, no. But it's one of those things where I can't, you can't say if it was my kid, you would have done this because I don't know because my kid wouldn't have done that. But I know that you should have done something different. And I suspect that the reason you didn't was an unconscious bias towards, but he's just a sweet little boy and he's never done this before. Those types of things eat at you. Because if you go and make accusations, you're the butthole, right? And it's like that with kids It's right there as an adult. It's like that when you are in your own business and things happen to you. And that is a total, it's psychologically draining to have to constantly live in that. I mean, it's like a, a white man rapes a woman and the woman has to do everything in her power to prove it. And then at the end, they, they don't, give the white guy much of a sentence because they don't want to ruin his life. They don't want to mess his life up. You know, or or Kavanaugh or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that plays out over and over again. And that's a way that, um, you know, as a woman that, you know, it just perpetuates this. I think you could look at, um, you know, the industrial prison complex and say, well, <laughs> you know, they're not really worried about ruining other people's lives. And, right. uh, you know, the, the black community has been devastated by um, unfair sentencing and um, just locking people up. And um, so, yeah, it, I mean, it sounds like bias to me and it sounds right. like racist to me because I'm assuming the, the little boy's a little white boy. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, so. and it's just, it's one of those things where they're all the people involved are good people. We love sure. her teacher, but it's just, you don't realize in your mind, the decisions you're making are already colored by 400 years of history. Yeah. It's just ingrained in us and opening people's eyes to that, especially when they're on the privileged side of it sparks usually a very violent response to that. Nobody wants to be told you're doing this because of something that you don't even realize is inside of you because it hurts to be told that somewhere in you is this predisposition because we all want to think we're good people and good people have predispositions that were there before they ever even knew that they were picking this up from TV, from parents, from friends of parents, from wherever it just becomes normalized. Yeah, and that's why I love um, Harvard's um, implicit bias, where you just, have you, are you familiar with that? I'm not, no. um, So they did a study um, of just, uh, of what people's implicit biases are, and you can actually go and take the test yourself, and then it it just shows, it's basically a series of faces, you know, and it, and you're, and it'll give you like an emotion, like scary, you know, and you pick which one, and you're not supposed to think about it, and then at the end, it tells you like if you have gender bias, if you have race bias and, Mm. um, and, and it's pretty like, you know, like you see it and you're like, Oh my God, like, um, and and it's cause it's just right in front of you. And I mean, (laughs) something that I talked to my, uh, my friend Cole about is the white fragility, right? Mm -hmm. So people that look like me don't like to be told when they've done something wrong based on race. Um, but we have to start having those conversations because that's how it changes. Um, right. And it has to, to come from that. someone in the same group. That's the thing about it is that it, it's an, it's always got to be an internal thing for it to work. Uh, a man going to tell a woman you've done something wrong <laughs> or a woman going to tell a man you've done something wrong is not going to be met the same way as another man or another woman coming and pulling them to the side and saying, look, this is what it is. They still won't want to hear it 
but the reaction won't be so violent. And they'll actually go back and reflect. And the reflection is where the change starts happening. Nobody else sees that, but you first got to get them in a place where they're actually thinking about the thing from a different perspective because you put that seed in their head. That has to come from somebody in the same demographic. We need more people, we need more men going to other men and saying, that was jacked up, here's why. You need to, you need to change this about yourself. And being willing to take the backlash at the moment, but stand your ground and then let that person go on because if they're a human, they will reflect on it and small change will start happening. Absolutely. And, you know, and then all the buttholes at a certain point get weeded out because yeah. <laughs> there are people that aren't going to listen, but we don't worry about that. We worry about making change where we can, because I think there's far more people who want to be a good person. Yeah, absolutely. Know, they are a good person. And I think it's absolutely right. Like as, as you were talking about the, you know, being within your same cohort or your same group, um, I have two stories. I won't bore your interview. No, please. Please. Okay. I love stories too. Do you? Okay. So um, the first one is when um, uh, my boss, before I started my own business, um, sat me down for my review and said, um, I don't know if I'm saying this to you because you're a woman or not. <laughs> and basically I didn't hear the rest of the review because I was just sort of like, if you have to ask yourself that and you're saying it out loud, I think we know the answer, you know, yeah. and a lot of the things that he was saying, I'm like, you would never say this to a guy. Like you would never tell a man that, that they had, um, that they stood up for opinion. They had opinions <laughs> or, you know, I mean, and my whole job was to be an analyst. Right. So like, yes, I had opinions. You were asking me, I did all the research, you know, just because it wasn't what you wanted, Right. Like, okay. Um, Would it make you feel better if I called an assessment next time? <laughs> right. So, so there's that, right? I mean, where, and it's not, and I'm not even saying that the, the review was great overall, but it was like the preface and then it just discounted everything for me. Um, because anything I was just like, oh, is that because I'm a woman? Is that because I'm a woman? And, um, and so you're right. Like when people aren't aware of their biases or they aren't aware of how something like that would be perceived. Um, some of that stuff needs to be delivered woman to woman, <laughs> yep. you know, um, because we deal with that a lot. Um, you know, the being too strong or, you know, all of that. So, so that's the first one. The second one is um, when I did, I was in a, like a four day, intensive around equity. It was a, a huge training. And at the end, we were put in to cohorts, right? So all the white folks went into one room and all the people of color were in another room. And we could hear <laughs> the people of color were telling all kinds of stories. We couldn't hear what they were saying, but they were like having a good time. And in the white cohort, people were crying. Nobody would talk. It was like all of this. Um, shame and guilt and fragility like just this room of like probably 20 people and i i think about that quite a bit and like how um how i can change that so that people are able to act because what we need is not that <laughs> That doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't bring us forward at all for people to, um, you know, to be in that place of just crying and not wanting to talk about things. The way that we change things is to say, well, that shit's fucked up and what are we going to do about it? <laughs> because yeah. otherwise, otherwise, um, you know, it, it's all just going to be separate and it's not going to improve. At least that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's a, there are a few situations that I've encountered over and over in my life where you, you, these are the people you need to look to if you want to see kind of where the learning begins. Um, white women who have either born or adopted children of color mm -hmm. suddenly recognize racism because they see other people looking at their beautiful babies and young children and young men as they grow up as things that they are not, as threats, as problems, or 
jumping to conclusions about a behavior here or there that this person has never experienced in their life. Those, those women mainly, especially those mothers, they, most of them tend to get it right. The ones who are paying attention, they, they tend to be like, I see this and this is wrong. And then another one, and this is very short lived, but another thing to pay attention to, and I've seen it so many times is people who have, um, let's say black friends who they hang out with in situations where it's not like the one black person and then a bunch of white people, but Mm -hmm. where it's just maybe a one-to-one where something will happen, especially something will happen with the police where they are there and they witness the tone difference, the quickness to violence dif- di- uh, difference, the, the, f- the fact that this person is in their presence being treated like a- an animal or a second class citizen literally just for being there. And they get so mad and so furious and ready to fight. And we got to do this and bro, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, chill dude why are you not pissed about this this is is my daily every day if i got pissed about this every time it happened i would i would be a time bomb and i wouldn't last long and it's it's those situations where you just get a glimpse into it and it's it's unbearable Mm -hmm. and then to see the person that you're next to is like that's a tuesday afternoon (laughs) right yeah. Nobody pulled a gun on me and I'm still walking home. It's a good day. Mm-hmm. And they're flabbergated. It's like, how can you exactly, how can an entire population of people live like that in this nation and be expected to function as equals mm-hmm. when our daily is didn't get shot, didn't get knocked down, didn't get taken to jail. It's a good day. Right. And let alone thrive. I mean, you know, function, you know, all of it, but, um, no, it's, it's, and you're right. And the same thing is true in, um, I can speak for my own family. Um, my family was very conservative until my brother came out as gay. (laughs) And then all of a sudden all those LGBTQ policies matter, you know, and it, it changes. Um, I mean, I was already liberal, but my, my parents were like, whoa, whoa, you know, can't treat my kid like that. Can't treat my kid like that, yeah. uh, which is great. Um, I, I just wish, um, you know, that we could apply it to other things based other than just our own experience. And that's, I guess, what, um, you know, I, I want to do. And, and I'm passionate about equity and inclusion. And so my question is, how can white folks like me best support black entrepreneurs and, and the issues that they've discussed, you know, that we've discussed today. And then also just like making life more livable in general. Yeah. So specifically black entrepreneurs, um, the best way to support the huge massive difference between black business owners and everybody else is that we don't have access to the resources or the networks or the connections that everybody else has inherently. We've been disconnected from those. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I grew up, I was, um, I was the only black kid in my grade in my um, Catholic, um, you know, parochial school growing up all the way up until the ninth grade. And then I was the only kid, maybe there was one or two others in private school at my church. So I grew up in a situation where I was kind of outcast in both uh, societies. However, going to school every day with kids whose parents were um, wealthy, um, I mean, wealthy, wealthy, they owned stuff and other people in the family owned stuff. Those kids grew up and when they got done with college, whatever they wanted to do, there was a family member who they could call out to who would give them access to resources, access to connections, access to suppliers, access to knowledge. Use what I've got because you're family. And there is nothing wrong with that. Nepotism is how wealth grows. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But knowing that there's a community that has literally intentionally been disconnected from all of the sources of wealth generationally, 
we need access to those resources. We need people who are willing to say, oh, you need this? Here is my connection. Here are my resources. Here is the knowledge. Here is how you X, Y, Z, and I'm going to walk you through it as if we were their own family. Because it's through those connections that business grows and moves. It's through those connections that your first one, two, three, four, five clients can come who are paying you money to get you off the ground. Um, in our community, you're just, you're trying it on your own from nothing every time. Yeah. And it's just, it is an uphill battle from the bottom of a very steep hill that most people aren't starting from that bottom. And, and I'm not saying because of not an access to personal resources, because there's, there's individual wealth in the black community. But sure. even if you have the money to start your own business, all of the other things involved with connecting yourself into the economy, you've got to get plugged in. And if you're not starting off with access to all those resources to get you plugged in to the folks who have the answers to questions or the resources you need to succeed or those first clients who need what you've got, uh, you're, you're starting off dead in the water. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, I think understanding that, that difference and how we can, how we can help each other, I think is a really, is a really big thing. I, I think it's all, all about communication and, um, yeah. And access. I mean, it's, it's like those, the, um, Dr. Claude Anderson, like his steps, right? Like we all have to start with that economy level and it's all the resources, right? And then you can start to excel to the other, other places, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we're all like there. And I think that what, um, I think it's changing in certain groups, but what I think that um, people don't understand is if we help each other, we all rise. Yes, indeed. I mean, if you just think about, all right, if, if there's three times as much unemployment in the black community as every other community, um, and I talk to people about this as well sometimes when I'm trying to get them to see a shift in mindset around um, race relations, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I show them these um, statistical disparities, uh, and then I ask the question of, you know, do you believe that there is something um, inherently broken about black people that inherently makes us inferior as humans such that we are so self-destructive and incapable. And they're like, no. Okay. So then if you believe that we all come out of the womb equally capable of, of great things, then there must be some other factor in play that is generationally making this group of people not perform like everybody else. So either you are literally a racist and you think, well, it's just their fault. They're less capable mm -hmm. or you have to acknowledge, no, there's an intervening factor. We need to find the roots of those intervening factors and we need to start breaking those barriers down so that this group can function the same as every other group. We'll have our own criminal element like everybody else does and we'll have our entrepreneurs and we'll have our workers and we'll have our, you know, everything else. But, if, if we're in a world where we would say that statistically based on, you know, per capita, we should have about the same average amount of whatever type of thing, whether it's good or bad in the community. If you notice there's a community that's not performing the same as everyone else and you believe that all people start out the same, you have to then logically go to the place of what are the interventions that are preventing these folks from performing Let's find them. Let's get rid of them collectively so that they can perform at the level of everyone else so that our economy can grow, so that we have less unemployment, we have less crime, we have fewer people in prisons, we have a flourishing society, and we, we are that Ronald Reagan beacon on a hill the rest of the world can look and say, I, I want to go there mm -hmm. because anybody, including those of us who were either brought here or those of us who were killed and pushed away who were here, anybody can come here and they're going to be able to succeed with hard work. That yeah. needs to eventually become true. And that requires self-reflection as a nation. What are the barriers that we still have in place 
that are preventing this from happening. And it takes more uh, people who look like me to speak out when they see injustice and when, um, you know, when the media is being racist, just flat out racist with what they cover and what they choose not to cover. And when the messaging um, doesn't match up with reality, um, which happens a lot. And, um, when all of those all of those pieces, when we all talk to the people who are in power and say this isn't acceptable anymore, I'm not going to buy from you. I'm not going to watch your TV <laughs> or whatever yeah. it is. Um, these things all add up. And then also, it's about supporting each other in business, whether it's with resources or um, buying from each other as small business owners um, and saying, "Yeah, I believe in what you're doing here." and I'm going to buy from you and I'm going to help you in any way that I can, whether it's, you know, taking you to a networking event with me or connecting you with somebody I know in in your field or anything, all of those small steps, um, they lead to big results. They're, they're so critical. Um, I mean, to helping people get what's theirs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the first time we talked, we talked a lot about that, that privilege, right? And use yeah. of it. We haven't even talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but you just, you brought it up, right? The, yeah. that, the dirty word of privilege, but I think it's because a lot of folks abuse it and they try mm-hmm. to use the word privilege to make people feel guilty rather than to use it as an empowering thing. You know, privilege means I get access to things other people don't just by simply by being and recognizing that that's a reality is the first step. And then the next thing is now that I know I have access to these things, what am I going to do with that access? Who am I going to serve with my privilege? And, um, you know, I, we talked about this before. I, I talk about privilege from the standpoint of myself. I am a black man in the United States. I am six foot three. I used to be a Marine. I have been an athlete my entire life. I am almost 40 and I look great. People like tall people. People like attractive people. I have lighter skin, which means I'm less of a threat. I went to private schools, which means I speak whatever kind of English America believes that I should be speaking, right? None of those things I had control of. I had no control over my genetics. I had no control over the fact that I had parents who sacrificed to put me through private schools. I had no control over any of those particular factors. And yet, because of that implicit bias you talked about, when someone sees me, they are more likely to want to engage with me. Hmm. Maybe not because of the black part of it, but all those other things are working in my favor. And so I get access to places and things with a lot less work than a lot of other black people do, or a lot of women do, or even black women do, right? And so when I have that privilege, when I have that access, who am I gonna serve? Am I going to go in there, take the knowledge, come back, build my thing and say, y'all need to figure it out? Or am I going to go in there, grab the knowledge, come back, build a podcast, teach people for free so that they can start building and growing as well? That's what privilege privilege is, power. But you need to have people who recognize first that it exists. It's not a dirty word. And when you recognize you have it, now you start trying to figure out, well, what places can I get into? (laughs) <laughs> what can I learn while I'm there or who can I bring with me? And it almost becomes yeah. like this scavenger hunt of how can I use this today to serve somebody? Yeah. I mean, I became aware of privilege before it was a, a word that was used, right? Um, because I was treated different in Peace Corps because I wasn't Kazakh or Russian. Um, but the way I, the place, the place that I start when people get all, however they get about privilege um, because people do get upset is I just look at them because they're white people (laughs) usually. Um, And I'm like, how many times every day do you think about your race? And white people never do. Mm -mm. I don't have to think about my race. I'm a woman. I case a joint to make sure that there's no creepy dudes around. Um, But you know, and, and if I'm going to my car at night, I'm checking everything, um, which is something that a lot of men I don't think have to do. Um, but I don't think about my race. Um, I've never been um, tailed in a grocery store um, because of my color 
because people just automatically assume that I'm going to steal. Um, I've never had these these different experiences. And I think that when you just start with that, like how often do you think about the color of your skin? Because that's privilege. If you don't have to think about it, that's privilege. And it, you can just look at it from that perspective. And it takes out the, but I grew up poor and I grew up, you know, because it's really about what you have to think about. Right. You know, what you're worried about, like on the daily. Um, and if you're, if you don't have to think about certain things, that's privilege. And then it's like, okay, what are you going to do with that? You right. know, because, it, because you do get, you do get access to other things. I'm short, um, but I'm pretty spunky. So I can typically <laughs> <laughs> weasel my way into things, um, you know, but I'm white. And so, and I mean, you know, look at me, look at, <laughs> I'm sure that you got the request for a podcast guest and you're like, what could this person want to talk to me? About? No, no. I actually um, looked and I looked at your bio and I said, I want to talk to her. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm just saying like, it's, it's, it's unusual, I think, um, for someone to be as passionate about equity as I am. And it's because once it was like, once I saw how bad it sucked, I was like, I don't want other people to, to feel that. That's terrible. And then it's slowly building into um, speaking out when I, like, when I see situations and um, just having these conversations and reminding other people, like, have you, has that ever happened to you? Yep. <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to be that person in my cohort, um, but man, it's, there are a lot of people that don't really seem to want to listen sometimes. And right. uh, so it's, you just keep trying. So you it's know? funny, um, you know, when we first talked and you talked about your experience in the Peace Corps, um, that's another one of those groups of people, right? You've got, you got mothers of children of color and then you have uh, typically bros um, who are hanging out with one of their black bros and they get pissed <laughs> off when the black, black bro gets treated unfairly. But then you have, um, white people, male or female, who have spent time serving the world mm -hmm. outside of these borders. And they have seen and experienced life outside these borders. Usually when I talk to someone who is as passionate about breaking these things down as you are, it's because they went out and they either experienced from the other side or they went out and they saw what unbridled racism looks like. And then they come back and, and it's funny when you've seen it without a cover on it and then you come back to the United States, even though there's a cover on it, you still see it because mm -hmm. now you actually, you know, the lingo, you know, the code words, you know, there's something in the black community we call code switching, which is, you know, as I'm talking to you right now, Jen, I feel really comfortable with you, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not being completely Gerald, right? When I go home yeah. to Arkansas and I am with my family and we are sitting around playing dominoes of space till two o'clock in the morning. This isn't the voice you get. And it's not that I'm putting on a show for you, but it's just ingrained in my being. This is how you engage with the world. And then this is how you get to engage when you just take it all off and relax. Mm -hmm. And that's racism works that way too. America has put, put a code into our language in the way that we talk about and with other people to where you know this is the real thing behind what I'm saying if you know the code. And if right. you don't know the code, you just think this is normally how people talk. But when you've gone out and you've served the world and you've seen racism and you've seen it without the cloak on it, and then you come back to a place where there's a cloak, but the code is there and you've already cracked the code, you're like, man, this is jacked up. I see what's going on here. And the person next to you is just like, there's nothing going on. What are you talking about? <laughs> and <laughs> right. Fire. Yeah, no. And, and it's so funny. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've had that experience. The other thing that there's a code for in this country that I didn't realize until I was out of it for a significant period of time is we like to act like we don't have a lot of corruption here. Mm. And I lived someplace where, I mean, the corruption was just 
out. I it's mean, just there. it is just out. Like the police. Why are we still sitting here? Yeah. He's waiting for his bride. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like we would be like, um, so they, we would take vans back and forth to the city. Right. And there'd be a police officer and you'd see him. And I'm like, Oh God, he just wants a bribe, you know? So he like waves the guy over and like the driver, as he's slowing down is like grabbing his wallet because he knows that there's nothing. It, he just wants money, you know? Yep. And and it happened again and again and again. And and it was similar to like my experiences around equity over there. It was like at first I'm shocked and then I'm mad. And then I have to break down like <laughs> why I'm mad and then reverse engineer it to be like, oh yeah, we've got all that stuff. It just looks different, you know? And then you begin to see it um, and how it plays out in other places. And and it's it's kind of another part of the privilege, right? Is that corruption and, and realize, you know, that I can get away with it, right. you know? Um, and, and part of that is about having that power and, and, and realizing it. Um, I think one of the biggest things that disappoints me about the United States is when I travel, there are so few Americans out there. And, um, I, I think that people need to get out and they need to see more of the world. Um, and I think that's a way that we build more understanding back home is when people travel and see things and have experiences. And um, I mean, almost half the people here don't even have a passport. And I'm like, what are you going to do if something happens? Right. <laughs> Got to get out, you know? Um, and so if there's one thing that people can do, it's is travel and have those experiences because it, it changes your perception. It, um, it, it changes your reality. Um, and then it's also just being awake, you know, and, and seeing things for what they are. Yeah, you know? there are, that's a, another, the flip side of that uh, in, in the black community, there's a lot of people who are trying to get younger kids and get them more experiences out of the country, traveling to go experience things because um, especially as a black American, getting out of this country shows you that you can, Mm -hmm. Um, so many people never even leave their neighborhood of the city they're born in their entire life. And so that's the only reality, you know, one trip out, even a lot of times just to another city in the country is enough to break somebody out and see there's some, there's more out here for me. And that's one of the things that's needed to, to, to break that, that mental block in a lot of, of young black people's minds is it just takes seeing that there's another opportunity out there than the one that you were born into a lot of times to just trigger the creativity, the passion, the drive. Um, it's hard to have those things if you've never either been told or shown that there's another way. Um, and I'm not just saying uh, towards either bad or good, but just, there's another way other than just saying I've got to good, get a good job and I got to get married and I got to raise my kids in this city that I was born in. That's not the only option. Go out, experience the world and then start thinking about how you can make an impact on it. It's travel is so, so very important to young people just to, <sighs> yeah. that's when their minds are most malleable. That's when the best ideas come and so many people, and it's not just black, it's all different colors, just everybody make it yeah. all the way through adulthood without ever having had the chance to dream or to scheme about how they could make an impact. <laughs> and I think that's a perfect bridge to like talking about your work, because I think that you do a lot of helping people um, see those possibilities. I think travel definitely among kids like opens opens people's minds to possibilities, but um, I think you do that um, with the people that you work with. Indeed. So um, my, my coaching uh, as a business coach, I've launched a coaching program called dopebusinessplan.com. And uh, DOPE is an acronym. Uh, it stands for define your strategic objectives, organize your business model around your lifestyle, prioritize your work streams to automate, delegate, and outsource what you can, and then execute your role as the chief executive of your business. And um, I started this because of doing the podcast. I, over the course of the last year and a half, I've interviewed almost 50 business owners. I've had emails and then conversations with dozens more, and they're hungry, they're passionate, but 
like a lot of business owners, regardless of race or gender, they, they start a business because they're passionate about something. They're really good at something. They want to serve people doing it. And the problem with doing that successfully is that eventually you have so many people who want your service that you have to actually run a business. <laughs> and a lot of them either don't have a business background or don't know how to make that transition from self-employed to being a CEO. And, and that takes structure. That takes building the right pieces in place so that your business can be an entity in and of itself that works whether you're in the office or not. And so I started my program specifically to hit those business owners who've been doing it for a few years. They're successful, but they're in the business all the time. They're missing their kids' events because they're on the phone or they just can't be there. They're not present on vacations if they take them at all. And family life is suffering. Mm -hmm. Business might be doing good, but if you can't step away from it ever, uh, eventually something's going to break. So I want to see people win. I want to see business owners win. And, and winning in business eventually means being able to make money without physically having to be at the helm all the time. And that doesn't start once you have a medium or a full, you know, large company that starts literally with the structure you put in place at the very beginning. So that's what my program is about. Um, I know it says business plan, but it's not about the business plan. It's not about writing some 15 page document you're never going to use. It's really about the business model uh, and getting the right structure around the business and then building in the pieces so that, I can actually just go enjoy life with my family and it keeps working. Yes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think that's what, um, when I, even when I started, I was like, yeah, I want to be sitting on a beach somewhere, just watching the money come in. <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, I think it's good. Even if you have, uh, some service delivery direct with, um, clients, um, it's always good to leverage, into other places where you don't have to be there um, because things happen, you know, right. uh, life happens and you do need to be present, um, you know, for your family and your friends. Um, well, and a lot of business owners really, they don't think within their business model structure, they don't think about how they make money, right? They start out just saying, we just need to serve clients and so we need to make money. And it's all very transactional, right? Mm -hmm. They don't think about structuring in, how do I first move from transactional to recurring, right? Mm -hmm. And then once I move from transactional to recurring, how do I move from recurring to passive? And, you know, it's, it's a big thing nowadays, right? Create passive income, passive, passive, passive income, right? But passive income doesn't come day one. Passive yeah. income is something that you structure to eventually get to. Um, I'll use myself as an example because I, I love transparency, um, this dope business plan program, I'm focused on the experienced business owner right now because it's a coaching program and we're going to get together for group coaching periodically on video conference calls where I record those calls. And as I go through that with my coaching clients and those recordings, those are going to eventually become a self-paced course that you can just buy. And you can watch the videos on your own time and get the same value and make the changes in your business if you don't want to spend as much money on group coaching. So you start out by creating a transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. I coach you one time. You're better. Hopefully on the backside of that, you see, hey, I still need this guy's advice. And you put me on a retainer. And every yep. month you're paying me a certain amount of money just so you can call and ask me questions and I make sure that you keep getting better, right? So transaction to recurring, mm -hmm. but I'm creating the content as I go along so that on the backside, I can put it all together in a course and just say, come to this site. This is what you need. It is proven. Buy it from me. Here's the money. Here's the course. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> and that's passive income. But you structure from day one to eventually get there. And that's exactly what the dope business plan is about structuring for that eventual hands off business. Which is fantastic because what you're also getting, if you structure that in from the beginning is, and I'm sure that you're finding this right with like group coaching, you're getting that feedback. So 
you're, you're collecting information, you're getting data from the people you're working with. So then actually um, future group programs are better and your online program is also better. I mean, it's truly leveraging everything, all of your expertise, all of what you're hearing from people into a product that you don't have to be present for. Um, and that is beautiful. Yes. <laughs> That's what everybody needs to be aspiring to, especially since more and more, um, I think people want to just buy things online and, and do it themselves. Um, yep. And that's really our 21st century economy. I mean, since since the financial you know breakdown in 2008, so many people just said, I'm done with this. And this whole economy has blown up. Um, but now it's a matter of we got to refine it. There, there's a lot of not real people out there who are just wasting people's money and time. Yep. We got to refine the this this economy so that it's a structured way of going about the business of eventually getting to that passive income by delivering value. I think that's great. Um, do you have anything to offer? Like how can we go get the dope business plan? Yeah. So the, the first question I have for you is <laughs> when will this likely be airing within the next, how couple long? Of, couple of weeks. Okay, good. So we'll be good <laughs> by then. So, <laughs> so right now I have, I have an actual ebook in production um, that is called the five, um, five low cost automation tools to transform your small business. Um, and I'd love to do a whole other podcast about a really easy way to put together a valuable ebook because I did this process and I had it yeah. built in a week. <laughs> um, but right now it's out on Fiverr getting made pretty. Um, but yeah, so five low cost automation tools to transform your small business. Um, you will be able to get that at dopebusinessplan.com slash get the book. No dashes in between, just G-E-T-T-H-E-B-O-O-K. Okay. Um, the, the regular main page is dopebusinessplan.com. And then for me, you can reach out to me on any social media site that's normal. Like I'm not on Snapchat or any of that stuff, but <laughs> all of my socials are the same. It's GW Jones, I, I on all the socials. And my email is, is Gerald at hapticconsulting.com. And we'll put all of that in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for being here. I've had so much fun. Um, I'm hoping, yes, we will talk about eBooks or whatever you want. You're welcome to come back anytime. I would love that. So I, I, I went through this process. It was so quick. I said, oh, I have a 25 page book and it only took me a day. <laughs> this is awesome. So yeah, I would love to come back and, and share what I learned with that. Cause like I said, I love helping people win. Thank you for listening to the Third Paddle Podcast. Be sure to catch every episode by subscribing on iTunes. To learn more, check out our website at www.thirdpaddle.com. The Third Paddle Podcast is sponsored by Foster Growth LLC. Online at www.fostergrowth.tech.